Hi, and welcome to Problem Solving in Chemistry. This is Chapter 1.4. Let's look at the objectives we'll cover today. We're going to identify the general approach to solving a problem. We're going to describe the steps for solving numeric problems. And we're going to describe the steps for solving non-numeric problems. Let's look at a crossword puzzle. Think of the steps you might take when solving a crossword puzzle. Do you solve all the down words first and then all the across or vice versa? Do you just go through and answer whatever you can and then go back and see if you've got some clues from the ones that you've done? Do you stick to one part of the crossword puzzle and then move on to the other part? All these things I described are different plans that accomplish the same goal. Scientists use similar plans to approach the process of solving chemistry problems. Think about things you do every day. How do you plan them? When do you plan to do your homework? Is it always the same time every day? Is it the same order of subjects that you study? What do your friends do? Do they do it exactly the same way that you do? Do you both reach the same goal? You usually get there if you have a plan. So for instance, maybe how you cross Biscayne Boulevard going to the Metro Mover. Do you just run across the street and hope that cars don't hit you? I would hope that's not the way you do it. Maybe you make your own lunch in the morning. What do you do? What are the steps you use to make it? What about the chores you're giving at home? How do you manage those? We do planning every single day. So it's no different in chemistry. And here are some possibilities that you might have talked about with a crossword puzzle. Here's a lady. And she's looking at something at the supermarket. What problem is shown in this picture? Yes. She's trying to decide whether or not to buy that product she's looking at. What's she doing to solve this problem? Yeah, it looks like she's reading the nutrition label. She's concerned about what is in the food and if it's something she wants to add to her cart so she can serve it to herself or to her family. It's important that when we have a problem, we ask the right questions and we also gather the correct information that we need to help us solve the problem. For instance, we may look at charts, tables, graphs, or other type of visual data to help us solve a problem. You know, the skills that you use to solve a word problem in chemistry are not that different from those you use while shopping, cooking, or planning a party. Chemistry, like all science, is an exercise in problem solving to explain the world around us. Thus, while memorization is a component of learning, Chemistry is not just a bunch of facts. We need to develop problem-solving skills to help us solve the things that we will learn in chemistry. The facts that we might memorize or learn help us to solve those problems. Because what do scientists do but look for solutions to the many mysteries around us? What's the difference, do you think, between problem-solving skills and memorization skills? If you answer problem-solving skills involve analyzing information, that means looking at the information, thinking about it, what it means, coming to a conclusion, that's problem-solving. While memorization is simply being able to repeat a fact or a sentence exactly as it was written or told to you. So 
a life skill that is much more important for you is problem solving. So let's look at how we can solve numeric problems. First word is analyze. The word analyze means that we look at the problem at hand and think of what is it asking us. Okay, what do we know? What has been told to us? Are there equations that we might have learned that will help us to further analyze this problem or to calculate or evaluate it? Okay, so analyze is determine what is known and unknown, then make a plan. So you have to know what's known and what's not known. So a good way of doing that is writing down what you know, what is given, and then making a plan on how to solve it. If you expect the answer, or the unknown, to be a number, you need to determine what unit or units the answer should have before you do any calculations. If we think about the density lab we just did, we know that density has grams and milliliters in it, so we can't all of a sudden change it to kilograms and liters, or gallons and pounds. We have to keep it the same. In part of planning, you might draw a diagram that helps you visualize a relationship between the known and the unknown. You might need to use a table or a graph to identify data, or to identify a relationship between a known quantity and an unknown amount. You may need to select an equation that you can use to calculate the unknown. Now let's think of the word calculate. What do you think about when you see the word calculate? If you make an effective plan, then doing the calculations is usually the easiest part of the process because a calculation involves math. And if you've already set aside all that you know and unknown, you might have written down a formula that has everything in it except the one thing you don't know. For some problems, you will have to convert a measurement from one unit to the other. I've already mentioned like grams and milliliters. So you can easily com convert milliliters to liters because a thousand milliliters equals one liter. And just like we saw in the density problem we had in class, you can flip that if you need to, to convert from one to the other. For some other problems, you may need to rearrange an equation before you can solve for an unknown. So think of algebra and how you did equations in algebra. It's as easy as that. So calculate right is using math skills to find an answer. The next word is evaluate. We've analyzed, we calculate it, and we evaluate. Think about what that word means for a second. Okay, evaluate means to determine if the answer makes sense and has all the required information. There are several questions you may want to ask about your answer. Is the answer reasonable? If you have 10 people, each with one balloon, and you say, oh, there's 100 balloons, is that reasonable? Maybe there was a math error made when you did the calculation. So you have to think and look at your answer and evaluate if the math sounds right. Or does it make sense? If not, reread the word problem. Did you copy the data correctly? Did you choose the right equations? Ask yourself these questions to analyze and evaluate if you got the right answer. Or does it sound, does it make sense?
Okay, let's practice. We're going to take a trip. We're going to go to Austin, Texas. And you're at, in Austin, Texas. And you want to decide to walk from the Capitol to the Paramount Theater for an afternoon performance. The shortest route from the state capitol in Texas is to go four blocks. Now one piece of information that I will give you is that the conversion is 10 blocks is equal to one mile. And it's four blocks from the capital, and it's in a direction, the south direction, so four blocks south. All right, so that's the information that we know. We want to know how many minutes the trip will take if we can walk one mile in 20 minutes. So our rate is is equal to um, one mile. per 20 minutes. Okay, so that's our rate. Okay, so we should use the steps we just learned. Analyze, calculate, evaluate. Okay, so let's go to the analyze step. What do you do when you analyze a problem? You figure out what you do know and what you need to know. So we wrote this down. We know that 10 blocks equals one mile. We know the theater is four blocks south of the capital. And we know the rate that we can walk is one mile every 20 minutes. Okay, so there's our problems. Let's look at what we got. So that is right, we've got our four blocks, our walking speed is one mile in 20 minutes, and one mile equals 10 blocks. What we don't know is the time of the trip in minutes. So now we have to think about how do we calculate that from the information that we have? So let's go on to the next slide. Okay. So four blocks is the distance we travel. Now look at what happened here. If we look at this, oops. If we look at this, we can see that we have our four blocks. Now I said it was t we could walk ten one mile. Well, one mile is 10 blocks, or 10 blocks is one mile. So it doesn't matter which way we do that conversion. But we want to get rid of this label. Because in math, you're used to just having numbers. But in chemistry, we're going to have labels, and we have to take care of them mathematically. So we're multiplying blocks times miles divided by blocks. So the blocks will cancel out. And we're left with miles. So four blocks is 0 0.4 miles. Okay, so one mile per 10 blocks. If we had miles, we would flip this term. Okay, next thing we want to do is convert our miles into minutes. Since we know one mile is the same as 20 minutes based on our information on the previous slide, we take our 0.4 miles, notice that our miles are canceled out, and then we're left with minutes. Our answer is 8 
minutes. It's very important to notice that the units cancel. Now we have to think, does this make sense? All right, let's think about it. If our rate is one mile is 20, 20 minutes, are we walking less than a mile? Yes, so it should be less than 20 minutes. If we were, walked half a mile, it should be about 10 minutes. 0.4 miles is a little bit less than that, so eight minutes does make sense. Did you see how I evaluated that? I thought about how much time it should take to go for one mile. Then I did a really easy calculation. What's one half of one mile? That's a half a mile, 0.5 miles. And half of 20 minutes is 10 minutes. 0.4 miles are just a little bit less than a half a mile, so we ha should have a little bit less than 10 minutes. Eight minutes makes sense. So that's a reasonable answer. Notice I said it's a reasonable answer because evaluation is usually an estimation. We've already calculated our answer. We just want to make sure in our mind that it makes sense. And we do that by estimating and seeing if it falls into where we think it is. What if I got 18 minutes as my answer? Then I would know through my evaluation that I did something wrong. What about non-numeric problems? How do we solve those type of problems? Okay, the steps for solving a non-numeric problem are analyze and solve. So let's look at the following flowchart. Okay, so we analyze the problem. We ask, is the problem numeric or not? If it's numeric, what are the two steps that are missing there? If you said calculate and evaluate, give yourself a pat on the back. If it's not, what should we do? Okay, so if it's non-numeric, our step is simply to solve. So you analyze what's all the information you have and how can you solve it? What do you have to do? There might be something you have to do. There might be something you have to think about. There's no calculations in a non-numeric problem. So let's think about this. What is the process for solving a jigsaw puzzle? So you could say analyze and sort the pieces to construct the border first, then use clues from the picture on the puzzle box to fill in the interior pieces. That would be a perfectly good plan. So your solving is going back to planning again. Suppose a box is locked and a large number of different size keys are available. How should someone proceed to find the key that fits the box, or the lock of the box? Well, you look at the lock, look at the size of the lock, and then you look through the keys to the keys that are either too small or too large to meet the keyhole that you want, and then you try the rest one by one. So by analyzing what you have, you have a locked box with the key keyhole on it. You have a bunch of keys of different sizes. You can eliminate all the keys that are too small and all the keys that are too big, but then you have to go one by one to test the keys that are the right size and will fit and turn the tumblers of the lock. So you have to solve it after you analyze and eliminate some of the things that you don't have to worry about. Okay, here's a good one. You've probably seen these, this problem in a movie. How could a delivery crew move a heavy piano up from a truck to an apartment on the fifth floor of a building that does not have an elevator? There's several ways they could do it. They could take it apart and carry it piece by piece up the stairs. They could get some sort of crane or hoist and bring it up in the sky and into the window. If you've ever seen movies, you probably saw that quite a bit. It's really scary if somebody forgets it there, it has, has a little itch and lets go of the rope. Oh no, hope that doesn't happen. 
Better let professionals do that moving to the piano to the fifth floor. Okay, let's practice about how we go into word problems. Think of a problem, write it down, and when you come to class next time, trade it with a partner. You'll solve the partner's word problem using the correct steps. If it's numeric, you're going to do what? Analyze, calculate, evaluate. If it's non-numeric, you're going to analyze and solve. So your homework is to write a numeric word problem and a non-numeric word problem on a piece of paper. Bring it to class, exchange it with a partner, and solve each other's problems. Then we'll talk about it. See you in class.